Good afternoon. First off, I want to welcome everyone here. Um, I particularly want to welcome our panelists uh, for making themselves available, and particularly those that are joining us virtually. Today, we're going to be talking about the issues of workforce migration, particularly within the health sector, health sector workforce migration. Uh, I want to differentiate that between what we saw yesterday uh, in what I thought was really an excellent uh, parallel session, and that had to do with the involuntary um, migration of populations due to war, civil strife, instability, economic turmoil, and the climate crisis. Uh, we saw in that case the huge disruptions in people's health and welfare involuntarily. Today we're going to talk about a different kind of migration, and in some ways we can consider it the voluntary migration. And in this case, it's migration of critical health workers from um, one part of the world to another, largely in populations where we have seen uh, lower economic um, conditions, where access to health care is already fragile and unstable. But there are a range of pressures and dynamics that we'll be talking about this afternoon uh, that speak to what drive or the push-pull dynamic. Uh, the poll of why health workers are moving from one country or one region to another, and the, uh, the push dynamic um, as well. We have a really stellar uh, panel. I'm pleased to be able to uh, have met them over the last couple of days. And we will have, first off, a keynote uh, presentation from uh, Jim Campbell, who's joining us today from uh, Geneva, and he's the director of the Health Workforce Department at the World Health Organization. Uh, Jim oversees the development and implementation of global public goods, evidence and tools to inform investments in the education, employment, and retention of health and care workers. Uh, he is also responsible for the implementation of WHO's global strategy on human resources uh, for Health Workforce 2030. Before we get started with Jim, I just want to lay out the process that we will use here. Jim will provide us with a keynote overarching presentation. Uh, I will then ask our panelists one by one to come up and further continue the discussion um, with respect to this issue and then open it up to a discussion among the panelists for them to have a chance uh, to talk about these issues among themselves, um, maybe clarify some questions in their own mind that came up during the presentations, and then open it up to a larger audience so that we can collectively begin to explore this issue in greater detail. Uh, with that said, uh, Jim, can I invite you uh, to provide us with the keynote presentation. Thank you uh, very much. Good morning uh, from Geneva. Good afternoon to Bangkok. Uh, Dennis, uh, Joe, Felita, pleasure to join you virtually. My apologies. Uh, the executive board of the WHO is meeting here in Geneva this week. A packed agenda talking about preparedness, universal health coverage, non-communicable disease, etc. Uh, and the, the, the issues around, you know, are health systems uh, fit for purpose to deliver against this ambition? Do they have enough health and care workers to, to drive the agenda forward? And clearly we're hearing from member states, the number one challenge, a global shortage of the health care workforce and national shortages uh, in high income, middle income, low income countries against the demand for services that post-COVID and the, the continuing uh, challenges around emergencies, climate, et cetera, et cetera. So a pleasure to give you a few perspectives to set the scene uh, of some of the discussion from the WHO side uh, to take further forward. I share my screen. Dennis, just confirm you can see, hopefully, on the slides. Yeah. 
Okay, so the clearly health worker migration is a long-standing issue for over decades and centuries. Um, but what we're seeing uh, as a result of the, the COVID-19 pandemic and some of the challenges around the world is this real increase in migration from east to west, north to south, south to north, uh, around the world. Parliamentary discussions, uh, newspapers, The Economist, everyone looking at this challenge. And the language, you know, clearly talking about shortage, about brain drain, piracy in some instances coming further forwards. Um, and we've continued the interest in this from this perspective around, well, what is the size of this migration pathway? Are the trends uh, confirming that it continues to be, a, a, you know, consistent over the last 10, 15, 20 years? Or are there increasing trends and volumes that will be right, give rising concern to this phenomena? Uh, especially in terms of the impact on uh, those countries with the greatest shortages in relation to universal health coverage and, and uh, the preparedness of genders globally. So what does the data tell us? We've just updated our 2023 uh, numbers, and, and this is part of the submission to the United Nations as part of the SDGs at the tail end of last year. What we're seeing is about two points, at least 2.7 million workers uh, have gone through a migration journey working outside of their country of qualification of birth. Um, that represents about one in 10 of those professions from, a, from a, a sample of 133 countries. So clearly this is underrepresenting the total numbers, but it's, it's a fairly good positive sample size that we've got out of the member states. Uh, of that 2.7 million, the, the greatest, the occupational group in, in, in most greatest numbers, nurses uh, and then physicians. And, and what you can see then is that many of those migrant workers are concentrated in 10 high income countries in particular. So this disbursement, the trends and the movements is tending to go to a particular group of high income uh, countries with that economic purchasing power to grow their workforce in response to population health needs. Um, when you look on the right hand side of the slice, then about the okay, case, so what's the result then in the country? What you tend to see from the numbers, uh, and these are averages, of, of course, um, maybe one in three workers in a health system in those countries and more medical doctors, pharmacists, and dentists are foreign born. Uh, one in six nurses. So it is a considerable share of uh, our workers. Has the share increased? Yes, the COVID-19 pandemic effect. Uh, what we're seeing is that many countries uh, opened up their regulatory practices to make it easier to recruit international medical graduates, international nursing graduates and other occupations. And we've seen that surge demand, that additional investment into health systems, fueling this further growth in migration and including the growth in the care sector. It's not uniquely the hospital-centric um, health facility deliveries sector. It's also the long-term care sector, which is increasing this demand uh, in terms of the burden of aging in many of our uh, higher income developed countries. But the topic of today then is to put that data into context around this decolonization agenda um, that PMAC is exploring uh, for PMAC 2024. Um, and the question is clearly then if we're talking about decolonization, which let's, let's go back, does colonialism actually have an influence on health worker migration? Has it historically? Does it today? And the literature seems to confirm, yes, uh, there are clearly influences in terms of the, the colonial legacy in health delivery models, in health education, in health sciences, in health researches, which is still having 
this push and pull factor uh, to encourage migration to education, migration to career development, migration for economic reasons that are coming through. And those patterns do follow the colonial linkages, the languages. We see Anglophone um, countries formerly of that Commonwealth era going towards the, the UK, Canada, Australia, the US. We see Francophone countries looking at the opportunities in France and Belgium. These migration pathways clearly have those links. And, you know, the, 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 the issues about this, about the dynamics and the imbalances, again, the evidence clearly says that some of this is linked. Um, but then if we accept that uh, hypothesis and that evidence that there is this real uh, critical influences and factors that are, are continue to perpetuate this discussion, what is the decolonization agenda? Uh, and it's complex and it's, it's multifaceted and the literature continues to evolve and the science continues to evolve, but there are some, some clear elements that we can acknowledge. First of all, that we, we have to recognize inequalities, exploitation and injustice. We have to look at the dynamics of power in these relationships and acknowledge some of them or not. We need to look at more collective decision making rather than purely uh, for the global north uh, taking a lead role. And we have to look at our models that, that have just been perpetuated over centuries now, decades, around health service models, health education models. Uh, it's fantastic to be uh, graduating advanced practice nurses who can um, do uh, all the work around nuclear medicine, trauma, oncology services. But if the demand in a country is around a burden of disease, population health, sexual and reproductive health. Are we over-educating for the scope of practice in these systems? So clearly questions around the, the appropriate models for education and practice need to be considered. Um, so let's try and apply those principles to the migration discussion. Um, and the, put the question forward. I'm not gonna necessarily answer it in entirely. That's part of today's discussion. But is the global code of practice on recruitment of uh, health personnel an example of deep online migration, at least in theory? Um, it was uh, resulting from a, a pure, you know, global recognition around the world 20 years ago, almost, in fact, 20 years ago now, uh, the executive board in the World Health Assembly put the first resolution forward uh, to say, look, the context of the Millennium Development Goals, countries are not going to achieve these. And part of the reason is the global bond, the global shortage of workers in, in uh, uh, what was at times 57 countries in crisis. Uh, it led to this, therefore, co development process by all governments. Thailand um, uh, has an historically champion on the health workforce agenda, co led the process of negotiation in the World Health Assembly in Athens. And it looked at this mutuality of benefit for countries, recognized inequalities, trying to address it. So, in theory, potentially an example of it. What did it achieve? Uh, we see the highlights in it, some, some key ethical principles that the, the workers, the, both countries, the source and the Western nation countries, and the workers, all those perspectives should be included in managing the migration in a more ethical way. Um, it looked at then, and this is an under-recognized part of the code, the ethical recruitment one part of the code, the second part of the code, is actually um, as important, if not more important, in terms of the responsibility, a shared responsibility to build health systems capacity in developing countries, low and middle income countries, and to ensure that that, you know, that shared solidarity included co-investments, include investment into reducing the pool factors in the high income countries to expand their own education models and investment in the expansion of the education and the retention models in the developing countries. 
that's you know has that become reality it was a key highlight it was a key principle that uh, come further forward so it's um and the other element was that the member states recognized that migration is continuously evolving and so the code had to evolve and it is a dynamic text and it's meant to be regularly updated and brought in to reflect these latest contemporary trends that we're seeing around the post-COVID acceleration. And I'll come back to that in a moment, and hopefully um, Joanna and Parisa will also talk to that as well. Uh, the code also led to a specific recognition of those countries that are facing the greatest shortages in relation to access to care. Um, um, Dennis, you mentioned that in your introductory remarks, this whole fragility around access to care from the emergencies from the pandemic. Uh, and the code had anticipated that. And it's a regular update to say which countries are actually struggling, which countries are more vulnerable than others because of their population growth, their burden of disease, their life expectancy issues, their system capacity, and to continuously update that. Uh, and to say these countries have to have safeguards against active international recruitment, and they have to have support. And again, the, this, this support here comes first. The support must be to co-invest, co-invest, co-invest in the education, employment, and retention of the workforce in these countries to bring them out of this scenario, situation, and vulnerability. However, let's be realistic, let's be pragmatic, uh, let's put the, the elephant in the room out in the open. Is the WHO code of practice in practice an example of it isn't working? Is it effective? You know, the intention, its relevance clearly um, there. However, does it in practice have an impact on some of those principles that the organization we mentioned? And, and the, the jury is out. Uh, and from a WHO perspective here in Geneva, we look at the evidence, evidence, evidence that member states share with us and try to assess that. And here's some sort of some headline messages. Yes, we've got better data than ever before. That's really impossible. We can't have an evidence-based discussion with any underlying data. And the trends are increasing over and above, but those trends are not uniquely between the traditional polar sort of debate um, around global south and global north. It's far more complicated than that. There is movement and mobility all around the world, and particularly south, south movement in greater Um, Are we seeing better transparency for in recruitment practice? For workers, yes, we're seeing better, better understanding, better appreciation. There is some mutuality of benefits for workers really coming into it. And the Philippines has been one of the, the world's champions on this for more than 40 years in terms of putting migrant workers' rights and employment conditions and welfare at the center. Uh, more member states are engaged. That's good. Uh, at least there's transparency and involvement. Um, but what we're seeing is that, you know, the evidence of impact of some of these engagement strategies, the bilateral level, they're not being measured. We're not investing in the underpinning research and science to improve our understanding of migration. Um, passive recruitment, countries are still seeing this. You may not have people flying in and turning up at hospitals and waving a flag and say, come and work in America. But the passive recruitment is real and individuals, highly educated, tertiary educated health professionals know how to access those opportunities through the digital era through employment recruiters etc so passive recruitment it may not be the member state the country but the employers the private employers the hospitals are still doing this work and the private recruitment let's let's call it that private recruitment agencies it's not colonialization but it's the the whole monetization it's the reality of their looking at this movement and mobility as an income opportunity they are still in the game. Uh, their adoption of the code is less, and their principles around ethical recruitment in some instances will still be questioned. Um, and then there's limited investment, for the, uh, limited evidence in the current investment, limited, limited evidence on this whole ethos that you know, 
um, let me go and work abroad for a few years and then come back with the for new experience and evidence. Um, so we've got a challenge. You know, the theory, the practice, we've got a challenge, we've got to drive improvements. Uh, we are inviting member states now to the governance process for the fifth round of reporting. All member states need to report this year and tell us what is the reality, uh, not just for the code of practice, but this decolonization agenda, but for the impact on services, the impact on access to care. Um, we will then convene a member state group to look at the effectiveness of the code over the next two, two years. And we're bringing the evidence together and I invite everybody with an, an interest in the research and the agenda on this topic, contact us. What evidence can you bring to the table to discuss this issue? We have to have a debate with these 10 high-income countries that are responsible for the largest share of migration and be asking them, how are you investing in your education systems, your employment systems to reduce the demand? And then there are a number of member states that are uh, offering um, the, in dialogue with WHO, talking about that actually this is a big issue for us. We would like to step forward and, and take a leadership role. And we welcome those opportunities to have a scientific debate, technical debate, but also a diplomatic consensus is essential if we want to be taking some of these things forward. Part of that evidence base are um, a new publication that we've got coming out on bilateral labor agreements will help uh, inform the technical, the scientific, and the diplomatic debate. Uh, Dennis, hopefully that sets a little bit of the scene uh, for you and Felipe and Joe to build upon. Thank you. Great. Jim, thank you very much. And, you know, first off, thank you for providing a really, I think, excellent overview of this situation. Uh, it's clear that the dynamics around the movement of health workforce that the wealthy countries with their own health workforce challenges with an aging population um, is continuing to drive. And we saw with the post COVID uh, numbers that this is a situation that is not being abated. Uh, it seems to be intensifying even more. So I think as we have our next two presentations, we'll have a chance uh, to move from the global perspective um, to be talking about how the health workforce dynamics are playing themselves out at the country level. Um, and with that said, I would like to invite um, our first in-person uh, panelist. Make sure I get everything correct here, Joe. I'd like to, I'd like to welcome um, uh, Joe Banton, who is the director of the Health uh, Human Resource Development Bureau in the Department of Health in the Philippines. Uh, Joe was formerly a professor and an administrator of Atenio uh, Graduate School of Business, and we'll have a chance to get a more country-level view of how this workforce dynamic is playing itself out, uh, particularly in the Philippines. Joe, can I welcome you up here? Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay, that's very loud. So uh, first off, let me say thank you very much for inviting me uh, to share the Philippine experience. Um, this is such an honor and uh, a great pleasure. And as I was pre preparing for the panel, I realized that uh, when you talk about colonization, decolonization and HRH migration, or as I was preparing, I had to be very honest painfully honest, to make sure that I wasn't candy coating any of uh, the experiences from the Philippines. I also had realized that I needed to be courageous to share our, our experiences. And so as I stand here, I have a disclaimer. And the disclaimer is that uh, some of the experiences uh, I have of uh, HRH migration and decolonization from where I sit, 
as director of the human, Health Human Resource Development Bureau uh, of the country, uh, the experiences are deeply personal and uh, some of the learnings and insights may not necessarily reflect uh, the stance of the Department of Health or our secretary. Uh, so <laughs> they are uh, mine and mine alone, although they are al mostly aligned. Okay, so uh, just to get that out of the way. And uh, just to, so we're on the same page, uh, the very simple uh, definition of colonization is that when a country or a group uh, takes control and, uh, and uh, possession over a territory or a culture and exer exercises dominance and power over um, uh, another country okay, for their own benefit. Following this very simple uh, definition, decolonization therefore would mean that there is a return of the power and control uh, and sovereignty and uh, uh, self-determination will reign supreme okay so um, what's the experience of the philippines we were colonized we were a colony for almost 400 years 333 under the spanish uh, uh, 400, uh, 48 years under americans and three years uh, uh, with it under the Japanese. In 1948, 78 years ago, we were decolonized. Okay, we were decolonized. Uh, that was July 4, interestingly, July 4, 1948. The Philippines celebrates its independence on June 12, but that's another story. <laughs> that's uh, for another time. But uh, 78 years ago, we were decolonized. Still, the vestiges of coloniz colonization is seen in the Philippines politics, economy, education, and certainly in migration patterns. So what does a migration, uh, migration look like in the Philippines? We actually have two kinds, like most of the countries that shared uh, a few uh, days ago. So we do have um, a movement of health personnel from the rural areas to the urban areas and uh, from private to government, which may be strange for, for some. Uh, and the reason for this is that uh, uh, this is only particular to uh, health workers, especially nurses, uh, who are moving from the private sector to the government because the government is more compliant uh, in providing salaries and benefits, okay? And then uh, the third type of, uh, of uh, movement that we see is from the health sector to the private sector or uh, in other industries. So the Philippines is one of the biggest supplier of HRH globally, but it's also one of the biggest providers of uh, BPO services. So nurses, pharmacists, med techs um, leave the health sector to become um, medical transcriptionists or backroom support. Okay, so this is what we see uh, domestically uh, in migration. But the bigger story here is we do have international migration. And uh, I have here on this slide the top 10 countries uh, where the health personnel are moving you know, with, with Saudi Arabia topping the list. But if you look closer at this list, you will see that there are four um, Gulf countries. And these Gulf countries uh, serve as the gateway. Filipinos don't usually stay there. They move to a second destination country. And uh, the rate is that uh, among the big three, um, health personnel, physicians, nurses, and midwives, physici we're, physicians are living at a rate of an average rate of about 250 per year. And nurses, about 13,000 per year. And uh, with midwives, we have two, uh, 350, around 350 living uh, every, every year. So uh, this is not a very interesting slide. 
because we have this experience across Asia where we know this story. Jim spoke of this actually. But um, what is peculiar and what I want to share uh, with the Philippine experience is that as Dennis was pointing out, this is voluntary migration. Not only voluntary <laughs> migration, but Filipinos want to leave. Uh, there is this notion of success, um, especially in the, the provinces, that when you have a family member or a child working abroad, you are a successful parent. So you can brag to other parents, I have a child studying abroad. I have a, a daughter, a nurse. She just sent me this balik bayan box. <laughs> that's, that's very Filipino. And uh, among all these push and pull factors, if we were to address the push and pull factors, I guess the cultural factors would be the most challenging. In the most recent oath taking, nursing oath taking uh, with the Pro uh, Professional Regulation Commission, the commissioner asked this audience of about 6,000 nurses and they said, okay, who among you are staying to serve in the country? No hands were raised. Who among you are leaving? Yay! All of them are leaving. And it's a gleeful leaving such that um, we, we, uh, there, we accept that economic factors, job-related factors, career-related factors are our are, are main uh, push factors. But they're not the only ones. And the worrisome thing is even those who may not have to leave actually choose to leave because there is this notion that a better life is out there away from the country. So um, the interventions that I spoke of are all encapsulated in a National Human Resources for Health uh, Master Plan. The country actually has a country-level uh, master plan, which is a multi-sectoral uh, document that provides policy and strategic directions to guide not only migration, but the management of uh, health human resources. Um, and if you look at this, there are six key result areas. There are three uh, green, dark green hexagons, and these are cross-cutting. They have to do with data govern governance and information management. They have uh, uh, to do with institutionalization and localization of the HRH master plan, because after all, it is a national plan, and we have to bring them down to the, le the basic level of governance and the institutionalization and strengthening of the HRH network. We have a network, a multi-sectoral network, that was responsible also for uh, devising or uh, developing this plan. The three hexagons in yellow are relating to the health labor market. So you see uh, from production, health education, strengthening uh, and regulation, going to workforce, which is uh, health, uh, HRH welfare protection and career development. And the fourth, uh, the, the last of these yellow uh, hexagons are on HRH migration and reintegration. So we have a separate KRA, a key result area spe specific to uh, migration reintegration. What uh, may you ask is the strategy of the Philippines, what is the direction in terms of migration? And this slide uh, says it, uh, our idea is to produce um, HRH, health personnel, and uh, have them stay for a bit in the country, especially the scholars. We have a huge uh, scholar pro scholarship program, especially for doctors, uh, pharmacists, uh, med techs, and midwives. And soon uh, we will have one for nurses and keep them in the country for a while. Think about whether they want to stay in the country or leave. So retention, it's a two-pronged approach, retention and managed migration. How do we retain them? We offer them our reality, uh, a possibility that, that the Philippines is also a green pasture and that, uh, that it is a viable option 
Hmm? So we offer financial and non-financial um, incentives. But for those who want to leave, those who want to leave has to be protected. We have to ensure that the rights and welfare of the health personnel who want to um, leave and uh, work abroad where they are welcome, they should be protected. Okay, and uh, there has to be a system of reintegration such that those who have left can actually um, bring back their skills that they picked up abroad, their skills and knowledge. Okay, but at the crux of this conversation on decolonization and migration, I think at the core of it is sovereignty and self-determination and being responsive to one's needs. And the way we're for, uh, moving along with this in the Philippines is to work with uh, partner agencies with other countries uh, through uh, bilateral and multilateral agreements, leadership um, uh, programs, and sp very specific programs. But um, we also take uh, learning for example, from WHO and other uh, agencies, uh, but we do not take the frameworks, for example, hook, line, and sinker. We localize them. So uh, just uh, as an example, um, we have this. Uh, I don't know if any of our colleagues from, D from WHO will recognize this. This is actually the health labor market framework, which we have localized. We have used uh, a symbol, the timba or the pale, which is ubiquitous in the Philippines and even in Asia, and used it to uh, send the message to analyze, in fact, data uh, concerning HRH in the Philippines. So there, uh, it's very clear. Uh, the narrative is fairly clear. We have a pale that we need to fill up. There is a pipeline that comes from the production side, but there is a leak in the pipeline, there is a leak in the pail. And these are the things that we need to manage. So um, that's something that we're doing, ensuring that, um, in fact, all these tools and standards are applied to the Philippines as necessary. The, the other example I'd like to share, and this is my last slide, is the definition of the health worker. Um, there is a, a standard uh, by, prepared by the ILO. It's called the index. Uh, oh, it's called the uh, international standard uh, international standard classification for occupation (ISCO). And in there, you have a list of health workers. But we took a look at our health workers and we said, no, this is not quite how we want to define them. And we realized that in the country, in the Philippines, in the time of UHC, there are two categories of health workers. The first category are health workers who provide health services catering to individuals. The second category are uh, of health workers are public health professionals whose uh, 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 goal in life is to ensure population health and uh, based on these two categories we came up with uh, uh, subcategories and we had to do this to make us understand what the needs of the health workers are in the philippines and i'd like to bring you to uh, this slide, which, which actually displays the issues per uh, category, category of health workers. So, for example, under category one, under the health service providers, we have the healthcare professionals. These are doctors, nurses, midwives, they're all licensed professionals, but they're not the only health service providers. We do have healthcare providers in the health facilities who are not professionals or uh, providers in the communities or not health care professionals or in the facilities who are professionals but who are not in health. They too are health service provi providers and they have different um, needs. Um, 
And you will see here displayed uh, uh, to the, bl the blue boxes will display the issues. Um, as well, the public health uh, professionals are, are, have two uh, subcategories, the public health scientists and the public health system administrators and managers. For the longest time, for the longest time in the country, when you talk of healthcare providers, you would only look at category one, that first box. You would only talk about category one A, the healthcare professionals, but that's not the direction you want to take. As dictated or suggested to the Philippines, we want to put emphasis on, for example, category two B, the public health system managers and administrators who run the system, who make sure that the systems are good so that um, um, we are able to come up with effective strategies. So just to point out, HRH migration is only one of the issues that we have. It's very important, but it's just one of the issues in one of the categories. We do not find this issue in other categories of health workers. So I end with that slide, uh, and I say thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Dennis. Great, Joe, thank you. And, you know, it's a very nice compliment to Jim's opening conversation, where we saw the specifics as they play out in this case, in the Philippines, and the really incredible dynamics. I'm gonna come back and ask you later, however, a question about the, what I saw as a very large um, attrition in the, the people who enter into the training and then drop out. So it's only about a quarter of those that um, aspire to be doctors or nurses, and about a, a third of those who want to be midwives actually complete and become um, actual professionals. What, 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 why is there such a... That's actually an improvement from 20 years ago. 20 years ago, it was 10%. <laughs> that is, uh, that's an improvement. But again, that's the other thing. Uh, there, the notion that this is an attrition is true. It's an attrition uh, when we talk of um, uh, health workers, potential health workers coming into the uh, health sector that are wasted. But is that necessarily true? Because there are many tasks that need to be done. And this, I, I'd rather think of this not as an attrition, but as a possibility, as an opportunity for other cadres, other occupations that we need to uh, uh, deliver services. In the Philippines, for example, you would see in that slide, I actually have that slide, um, those who do not pass the nursing board exams, we have a policy in the Philippines uh, that allows these underboard nurses to work in the hospitals, be paid, and augment the, the nursing service, and review at the same time, paid for the government so that they can pass. So there are possibilities. It's a way of framing this seeming problems. Right now we have a need for mental health advocates, health promotion officers. What then do you do about this uh, enrollees to medical programs who have completed two years, a year, but who have also completed college? So instead of looking at it from an attrition point of view, we can look at it from a, a possibility or an opportunity. Great, thank you. Dennis. Even if you do get those graduates, however, it doesn't necessarily mean that you'll end up having an adequate Correct. workforce given Correct. the poll that you were talking yes. about. Right. Yes. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, let's go on to our next presenter. And we're gonna move from the Philippines and we're to Sri Lanka, and we have uh, Palitha Abakun, who is well known within the global health sector. He's had a, a distinguished uh, career serving as an advisor to the World Health Organization, and is currently a member of the WHO World Bank 
Global Pandemic Preparedness Monitoring Board. Uh, until recently, he was one of WHO's uh, Director General's Special Envoys for COVID-19. Uh, and he's also been a Senior Advisor to the Ministry of Health in Sri Lanka and serves on a number of national advisory committees. So, um, Palitha, thank you very much for making yourself available. We look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much for, that, for those kind words. Uh, actually, my task is uh, quite easy. After Jim and uh, what you just presented, because uh, I'll be, I don't want to repeat to avoid the, the, the likely repetition, I'm going to make it short, but anyway, it will be somewhat complimentary what you heard so far. What I would like to share with you very quickly are these four points. What we might call broadly the influences of colonization on health systems and medical education, challenges, some of the challenges related to medical migration, the role of international bilateral partners, and Jim referred to that, the code mainly, and the bilateral agreements we have with some of the countries. Sri Lanka has a couple of bilateral agreements also. And finally, few possible responses, which I, I don't say solutions, but I don't, I don't believe there are some solutions right now, but some possible responses to mitigate what might otherwise be a bad situation. So let me start with the first question, or first point. Like Philippines, it's very interesting. We were a colony for 450 years. 150 years under the Portuguese, around the same time, 150 years under the Dutch, and about 150 years under the British. And we received what you call our independence, decolonization in the, in the de jure sense, one or two months before you did. I was in, the, uh, in 1948 on the 4th of February. Yours is on April, right? Yeah, so we are two, three months elder to you with regard to decolonization. We are two months elder to the WHO. WHO, as you know, was born in April, 8th of April, that same year. So we have a lot of parallels in terms of the chronology. Now, the two things I want to say about our colonization, two points. One, I am sorry, this screen is going to be on. There's no way I can take it out there. Yeah. yeah. No, I'll work it from here. Yeah, thanks. I'll take it from here. Yeah. Yeah, if you ask me, for example, what is possibly the, the biggest or the, in terms of magnitude, the largest uh, example of decolonization in our, in our region, I think it was India, the partition of India. We, I'm saying that because India, which had to have a, had a lot of struggle to get independence from the British, we were relatively is for us it was relatively easy after India. So there was no big struggle as such. And therefore, for us, we got independence, but we also still continue to remain under in the in the British under the crown for many years and then we are still in the Commonwealth. So that's our that's our history of decolonization and decolonization. The main, if you ask me what are the, what are the, what are the influences of, I'm just trying to make it short, uh, Jim, so, you know, I, I may get, you know, a little bit uh, disconnected. If you ask me the influences of colonialism in Sri Lanka, this is just a summary. With regard to health, we have a reasonably good system of health care. We have a fairly strong system of medical education, strong in the current sense, strong system of medical education. Then if you ask me what are the negatives of colonization which are still seen in some parts of Sri Lanka or in some aspects of Sri Lankan life, one is that the 
colonization process somehow has still not managed to clear the gap between the professionals and the community. There's a cultural gap in terms of what they talk, the way they talk to the patients, the languages they use, there is a gap. There is also a kind of, uh, I, I like to say it this way, but my Sri Lankan friends may not like me to say it this way. We replaced the caste system we had a long time ago with what I think is a class system. The professionals, particularly the medical professionals and the, and the community, we have that gap. Then at the same time also, because of the, the long years of colonization, our traditional systems of medicine which existed in Sri Lanka somehow got suppressed or submerged. So they became quite weak. So that's, that's, those are the two, what I would call the negative effects. But on the whole, with regard to medical education and healthcare, I like to think that the colonization experience is, has been helpful. Now, this may be controversial, Colonial, it, helpful because our system still remain the same. We still have a fairly good health system. We can argue or debate that later on. <laughs> yeah, it is so. And I, I, I have good, I, I say it to good authority. I asked a lot of, I did a poll before I came. I asked the question, do you think colonization with regard to health and education have been very negative or very positive? They say not very negative, not very positive, but positive. So that's where we are. I'll quickly go to the next slides and then we can have a discussion. Next, I just want to share with you a little bit of information data about uh, our migration. You know, over the years, we have had migration of Sri Lankan doctors, particularly a few nurses also. Um, for a long time, but the numbers that migrated out somehow were balanced by the, by the production. So we had no serious deficit, no serious uh, shortfall of medical personnel, sudden shortfall. The problem actually is we are beginning to see now in the last two, three years mainly, and this I think tallies with the last word in our, in our, in the, in the, uh, in the theme of this year's PMAC, polycrisis. We had two crises actually. One is the, of course, all of us faced the, the, the COVID-19 and Sri Lanka also faced in the last two, three years, a serious economic crisis, which has made life difficult for most people. So this has accelerated what uh, was a slow growth, slow moving phenomenon. And now we have a situation where, now I got this from the newspaper a couple of weeks ago, Sri Lanka short of 630 medical spe specialists per year. And uh, and it gives the numbers. And most of these people who are in this 650, about 250 are specialists. Specialists, as you know, in any country takes about six years to be produced. So we are losing some of the highest trained professionals in the country in numbers which were, which, which are unprecedented. That's our, that's our main issue now. And at the same time, younger doctors are also leaving. Now, if you equate that in terms of the, the loss in terms of investment, you know, in Sri Lanka, education from the primary level to the postgraduate level is free to the student. It's state expense. So when we say two, three thousand specialists have gone out of Sri Lanka in the last 10 years, I did a rough calculation last night, you're talking of about four to five billion dollars. So it's like a cash transfer in, in, a kind, in kind of that amount of money to the developed countries from a poor country like Sri Lanka. That's, I think, something that we have to bear in mind. And our solutions must also address that part. And there are ways I, will, I like to think that can be addressed. And where do they go? I don't want to, this, Jim said this quite clearly. They go mainly to five countries. Most of our doctors go to five or six countries. The countries which have the system of education that we have, UK, Australia, New Zealand, 
and to the United States mainly, and a few to the European countries. And there's one other factor which I think I need to share. These, these are the places where they go to. I won't go into the details, not, uh, not necessary. This is the situation in Australia. And these are the push and pull factors. I saw what you had presented, uh, Johannes. It's more or less the same thing in different words. They even out, yours and ours, there's no big difference. There's one other point I want to, to mention here. And that is that, uh, I think you know about this, I'm sure Jim, Jim, Jim knows about it, and those of you who are in, into medical education know this. Uh, we have this thing called the World Federation of Medical Education, which uh, is a federation made up of a number of bodies, including WHO, 12 different people constitute the World Federation. And now, now the ECFMG of America and the World Federation have declared or have made the decision that, particularly for ECFMG to go to America, that Anyone who wants to migrate as a doctor to America, USA at that time, must come from a medical school which is recognized by the World Federation or equivalent body. So the recognizing authority, the medical council of that particular country from which doctors want to go to the States, from, it was 2023, now they extended 2024 because of COVID they extended by one year. Have to come from a country where the medical council or the authority, that licensing authority, is recognized by the World Federation. So now all the countries, most of the countries in the world are rushing, rushing, rushing to get the, get the recognition of the World Federation. And to date, when I looked at the World Federation uh, website, there are 88 countries or medi 88 countries whose medical councils or analogous bodies have received the World Federation recognition. Now, my question is, is this a newer form of colonialism that is coming? Or are they screening people so that it is easier to get them across? They know the quality is assured when they do that. So this is something that we need to watch. And it's a development that I see will... Of course, I recognize, I chair the accreditation committee of my medical council, and we went through and Sri Lanka has been recognized. Which is, otherwise, the doctors will be very... Our doctors are very upset that it might, we might not get in and we'll have problems. So we have... We have had a good experience in terms of quality, standards, etc. This uh, recognition by the World Federation has been positive. But what it will entail in the medium term, I do not know with regard to migration, how it will play out. And that's a question that we like to... I was going to ask the Jim sometime if I got a chance. Then I'm going to conclude now. These to me are broadly some of the responses that we can make. One is that there is no one response. We have to have what I call a bundle of responses. And the bundle of responses you kindly gave in your slide, the different things that we can do to minimize, maybe not to totally stop it, but to minimize the external migration of our medical personnel. There are a number of things we can do. You know, the fact is we did a survey of our young doctors and the medical students about a year ago and ask them the same question, how many of them want to go, how many, and why, if they want to go, why, they, why do they want to go? Interestingly, about, only about 25 to 30 percent, I mean, that's a large number to begin with, but wanted to go. Then you ask them, what are the reasons? Reasons they say, they like to serve in the country, they like to be with their, with their families and parents. Why, why, why do they want to go? Mainly economic reasons. Number two, education, the children, they say. Those are the two top reasons why they, these are people who are intending to go or who are still not, not ready to go. The second point I want to make is with regard to how to meet the, the, the challenges, is the code again. The code is something that we need to examine. I, I know that Jimmy is listening. Uh, because we have, uh, like the code itself is to have bilateral arrangements, we have one with UK in addition to code. Intentions are good, but I don't see any reduction, diminution in the numbers who are going to the UK. There may not be government to government recruitment, it never was like that, people applied and went. And now I have seen the tendency that there are agencies, private agencies, which do the recruitment. Then similarly to Australia and to New Zealand. In fact, we have a saying in uh, Sri Lanka, 
If a psychiatrist goes to Australia, it's like going into a lion's den. Nobody comes back. So most, most of our psychiatrists are who go to Australia. In fact, we are tremendous short of psychiatrists. We are tremendous short of anesthetists. We are tremendously short, short of uh, emergency physicians. And many of them are in Australia. So those are the, 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 the micro issues or the meso issues which, which play there. So code is one. But my feeling is that right now, unless the economic situation and a number of other factors improve in-house, this is not going to be easy to stop it. But what we don't do, and which some of the other countries are doing, Thailand has done this, we can do a little bit more work with regard to the data we collect, the ones who are around and how they go. We might be able to do a little bit more by task shifting, where there are shortages internally due to internal migration. And we might be able to deal, do a little bit more by task sharing. China does a lot of that when they have shortages. So there are a number of solutions we can have to mitigate the situation. But a total elimination or a total reduction of this, I think it's not going to be very easy for us in the short term. And now I learn from my friends in uh, Nepal, they are facing the same situation. And Bhutan, which strangely was not a country where anyone wanted to go out, Bhutanese, even Bhutanese are not going to go. So there is something going on, something going on. And I think WHO and the agencies like us, we probably have to sit up and take notice of them, see seriously what we can do. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop there if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Alisa, thank you very much. Please sit down. Um, first off, I have to say I, I feel a special affinity with both the Philippines and Sri Lanka in terms of your independence. February 4th, 1948, Sri Lanka. July 4th, 1948, Philippines. December 4th, 1948. It was, a, it was a special day for me as well. <laughs> so, um, as I said, what, what I would like to do is to open this first off to a discussion among yourselves. Jim, are you still with us? Yes, I'm still here, Dennis. Excellent, excellent. Look, I'd like to throw this back to the three of you to have a discussion. We talked a lot about the global code. Um, and Jim, in your presentation, you highlighted the, to date, limited impact of the global code. And wondering if you could talk, maybe in greater uh, specificity, how, what would be required from your perspective, uh, I believe that you talked about more teeth needed in the global code. The bilateral strengthening of some of the clauses. But that is a question I want to do, two points I want to ask Jim are really that. Yes. Uh, one, it, is, one is, Jim, how, how do we strengthen the code and how do we make it work for countries like ours where, you know, the push factors are becoming increasingly important and not only the pull factors. Earlier, Sri Lanka lost doctors because of the pull factors on the receiving countries. Now we have our push factors also, our, in fact, dominating and that i think is, is a question that we, so how do you do that second thing is if you use that your question of circular migration how do you can we have something where people can for limited periods come back bring the and without getting you know they get pr status citizenship all that if they work four five years and want to do that so now i think people should have the freedom to go i totally believe in that you know we, we need that but uh, there are some who want to come back after a while and then uh, enter the system. So internally also, our countries have to make sure that we prepare the grounds. We make our regulations and our system ready to receive people who come like that. Often we are not ready to do that. They, you know, they are, the only place open to them is a private sector. So there are many, many issues. I don't, want to, I don't want to talk too much, but Jim, you know it best of all. So these are the questions that are in my mind. Jim, your reflections, particularly from a, a global perspective, how you see yeah, this no. potentially moving forward? So I think there's, there's a huge opportunity. Uh, that we, we, multilateralism and the, the international diplomacy and the various mechanisms for engagement 
uh, with us, you know, 75 years. You're all celebrating 1948. WHO 75 as well this year. You know, some of our <laughs> inter-member state uh, diplomatic mechanisms to have these conversations uh, being celebrated as well. There's an opportunity, uh, but we've got to drive that through data and evidence. Let's get, we recognize, and Polita absolutely on this resource transfer, this foreign direct investment. Uh, we're producing a, a, some new evidence papers with colleagues on that for the World Health Assembly for ministers to discuss. We want to be able to quantify that and then, you know, with that evidence. So what are the issues here? Like I said, what are the, the options and the potential opportunities to work towards solutions? Um, the code actually, if you think about it, it's, it, the instrument is 15 years old. It has had some impact, but it's, it's not the colonialism that is the big issue at the moment. It's the capitalism. Uh, we've got to recognize that there are many, many monetary incentives in the system for both push and pull factors. So we've got to recognize that people are paying for medical education out of their own pockets. It's not always public subsidy. In the Philippines, nurses pay for their nursing education through the private nursing schools. Uh, there are, uh, Joe will tell you, there are many international students who come to the Philippines to pay for a world-class nursing education that will give them a career opportunity elsewhere. Uh, so there is all this this human capital human capital development elements coming through but i am I'm, I'm a, an optimist colleagues i think if, if the member states if you put evidence in front of the ministers minister of finance ministers of edge put evidence in front of them you can have the policy dialogue and look at these opportunities but around the world again reality is the biggest employer of health and care workers is now in the private sector it's not in the public sector. And so how do we bring our private sector organizations on board to actually have them to have some of this corporate social responsibility, ethical responsibility around their recruitment practice? And that's where the code needs to evolve. Uh, I hope that Sri Lanka, that the Philippines, that many of these high income countries will take this opportunity and make the code a dynamic instrument to reflect the realities, give it some teeth. Give it some engagement. Joe, your thoughts. Yes. Hello, Jim. Um, I <laughs> hello. I've always had this uh, this question in my mind about uh, uh, the basic tenets or the basic uh, the key principles, I guess, about the code, and it has to be it has to do with the uh, fair treatment. Uh, uh, fair and equal treatment uh, for migrant, both migrant health, uh, personal health workers, and domestic. And my question is, the domestically trained health workers in the destination countries uh, are, are actually not in the same state as those coming from a source country. Because if you're there, the, the migrant workers will be coming to a new culture, a new system. They have been displaced. And therefore, I wonder what fair treatment really means. Is this equal treatment? Or is this, are we talking about equity here? Give to one where, where what one needs. So your thoughts on this, please, Jim. Absolutely. I think that, I mean, the principles and the articles of the Code of Practice really look at that uh, mutuality of benefits for the, the work and the source of the destination, including that lived environment, the occupational health and safety, the terms and conditions of employment, etc. And, and through the study of the bilateral labor agreements, that's a mechanism to implement those activities. Philippines is, is world class in terms of insisting on those provisions uh, for the integration of the Filipino uh, workers into a system with pastoral care, with ad additional support for integration uh, and opportunity and potentially for return. But uh, it isn't in every bilateral labor agreement that there is a 
a clear responsibility and a mandate for that additional element of support. Um, so where the Philippines always negotiates that, we haven't seen it necessarily in every agreement that has been shared with WHO. So we need to continue to get that done. And I think the principle is recognize um, if you are under educating in your own system and you are reliant on an international workforce, you have to be uh, demonstrating value to those future employees and you have to be putting incentives in it. Uh, the, the world's, uh, one of our ministers and the teams spoke to us and said, you know, normally they would have several thousand applications to go and work in their health system as nurses. But post-COVID, those applications are drying down because it's become a competition. Uh, people have got more choice. So if you don't offer those mutual benefits to the worker, you may not be the application, the country with, with significant applications in the future. Uh, so it, it will change, uh, undoubtedly. Uh, but Philippines, Joe, you know, you, the Philippines Overseas Employment Agency, the uh, Department for Migrant Workers, you've, you've been leading this for decades. Um, we need to learn from you. Let me ask this. One of the issues that came up early in the discussion had to do with the uh, push factor, the, um, the pride, the, um, you know, the prestige, both for the individual, but for the family. And the, as we were talking yesterday, you talked about many communities uh, took pride in having members of their community working in Saudi Arabia, the United Kingdom, the United States. Both of you represent an exception. You've both stayed in your homeland and you made the decision to commit yourself to addressing the health of Philippines and the health of Sri Lanka. What's different about you? First, you talk about me. <laughs> I thought I was out in the WHO for 24 years. <laughs> but I, that's what I'm saying. I got a chance to come back. I got a chance to come oh, back. You came back. Yeah, I mean, I think for most of us, I think coming home, there's no alternative. Uh, some of the people who go out, uh, they go out for economic reasons to begin with. To begin with, That's the first uh, push factor from Sri Lanka. Uh, now, unlike in Philippines, now my colleagues from Sri Lanka are here, there's slightly, uh, there's slight difference. Our parents don't take so much pride in saying my children are out. They take a lot of pride in saying my children, children are with me, but they are very happy to see them going right now to get out of this economic issues, issue. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, that's the reality. That's how human beings are. So they want to, to, to go and make it good and come. They, that's the situation. So there are a number of things inside which need to improve, apart from, you know, the destination countries. In the country, also a number of things to, to, to be improved and we have to take care of it. If that happens, I think we can slow down or even tail off because we didn't have big migration numbers earlier. This is the last two years. Am I right? Yeah? Sorry. Yeah, for me, Dennis, um, I, that's the same question I ask because if we could only institutionalize, if we could only teach or um, develop nationalism or patriotism through a, a certain intervention, we would certainly do that. And that's a question also that I have. How, how do we develop um, a disposition, for example, towards service or a sense of mission um, among health workers so that even if you know, the going gets a bit rough, they still choose to stay in the country. My own experience had to do with um, um, early exposure to uh, a difficult uh, political uh, situation in the country. And I made that uh, a, a decision at an early age to contribute. So I think it's really very individual. And it's certainly, an, um, certainly not bad to say, I want to go abroad and make our lives better, make my family's life better. But, uh, and, and so it's very individual, but the choice that I made was born out of um, an awareness that um, a single person can actually make a contribution and a difference. But again, it's, a, it's, you know, there's two dynamics here. There is the, um, 
keeping a workforce in, in the case of the Philippines, but it's also attracting a workforce back to the Philippines. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna ask another question, which has to do with the role of recruiters. Um, and to what extent does the global code provide an opportunity to better engage and manage um, the role of private recruiters. And as you said, uh, Jim, that um, most of the health workers that we're talking about are going to the private sector. So the role of the private uh, recruiter seems to me to be an extremely important one because even if you do have a sense of patriotism, there's also the enticement. Um, and we're all enticed. Um, we can all be persuaded. So how do, we, how do we deal with the recruiter in a way that doesn't disrupt meeting the health needs of individual countries? I would open up- Dennis, I'm gonna to have to um, leave you, unfortunately, because of the, the, the executive board situation here. Um, but um, just on that, it's an absolute key question. That's my optimism, optimism again. Member states uh, are invited now to, to produce their new reports for the World Health Assembly on the implementation of the code, convene the private recruitment agencies, have those conversations with them at the national level. I, I work with them to be saying, okay, what are the opportunities? There's some really good practices around the world. Um, you know, Germany has entered sort of parliamentary process and legislation, so the private re recruitment companies have to uh, apply the code. Uh, in the UK, there's a new uh, policy. Again, all private recruiters in the UK have to follow those principles and they can be sanctioned if they don't. The US does it through a code of conduct and a bit more voluntary. But there are examples emerging where member states are taking action uh, and convene them in the Philippines, in Sri Lanka, uh, wherever, in India, uh, and have those conversations and then bring them on board. Uh, I think most people who are post-COVID see that there's more... You know, everyone has to have health care, not just some countries. Uh, but let me leave it with you there. Thank you very much. And uh, I'll leave you, the audience, to continue. Thank you. Great. Thank you.
please. To answer that question. Um, in the Philippines, I think um, we'd like to push harder on government to government um, agreements. The Philippines should only deal with other governments, and these governments should regulate uh, private sector from their end. Uh, it has become so bad that private recruiters are going to the universities, recruiting from students. And, and uh, for most part, there's nothing we can do about it because, like you said, there is enticement to the university, to the faculty. Um, and uh, the recruiters are using social media. They go straight to the person. Oh, can you refer a friend? $1,000 for each referral which is very difficult to say no to. So um, unless we enforce, again, uh, government to government uh, uh, agreements, and only through this uh, uh, strong enforcement can we, I think, control this. And Palitha, your thoughts on this? Yeah, same, I agree. Yeah, a, a microphone. Yeah. yeah, what she says is, is happening. But of course, uh, Sri Lankan doctors do not uh, go through Agencies very much. Firstly, the numbers are not that big. Secondly, they have contacts. They go through mainly their own uh, fellows, friends, who are working in those countries. That's their uh, most commonly used uh, contact or the source there. And there are enough people who are willing to, to locate jobs for them and get them if they want to go. Second thing, of course, is we have this, uh, it's, it's not seen in any other country that I know, where it is compulsory, it is compulsory, not just uh, preferable. It's compulsory for all doctors who do postgraduate degree in Sri Lanka. It's compulsory for them to go out of the country to a developed country for at least one year. That's the rule. If you don't do that, you don't get your board certification. Now, it might sound for some of the, some of the others who are here, it might uh, sound a little bit strange. But that is there, it's, some, it's a relic of about 30, 40 years. So now that is also a positive thing for, the, for, uh, for migration, in that they go to these nice places all over the world, maybe UK, Australia, New Zealand, few to the states, and then it's easier for them to, if they want to remain, to negotiate a position to go back to. So the number of factors, all these have to be addressed. That's why I say, it's a, it's not a, there's no linear solution. It's, it's, a, it's a complex, it's a complex system. So we got to identify each one and address in, in a different combination. You, that's why I said use a bundle of incentives and that bundle should con will consist of different things even at an individual level or for groups. Thank you, I think we should give them a chance to say something, no? Great. Thank you. We're gonna shift gears now and I'm going to invite uh, members from the audience. There are, microphones on either side. Um, but as you are gathering your thoughts and thinking about your questions, I want to remind you, as you entered the room, you were given an evaluation page and very much would encourage you to uh, fill that out uh, and give it back uh, as you return, as you move out at the end of this session. Can I turn to people here now to um, begin opening up this uh, discussion. There's, yes, Thomas. Uh, oh, sorry, thank you. Uh, Thomas, uh, uh, long time with the World Bank, and I'm trying to uh, present this situation from the World Bank economist perspective. I would say we have a world, we have countries who have demographic deficit they're mostly rich countries. We have countries that have uh, demographic surplus. And these are mostly in uh, Global South and developing countries. So what's the problem? Why can't there be a win-win situation between the two worlds so that the, uh, the, where is a surplus labor, they can export the labor where there is a shortage of labor. So I would be very interested to hear, I think Jim is not there anymore, about this last point of the code, which was about win-win situations and negotiations and whether there are uh, good um, examples. And economists would say also, well, 
if you, this uh, generates a domestic uh, shortage, this emigration or migration, increase production. So, uh, okay, you don't have, you, you should, and you shouldn't do it with public money because there's shortage of public money. Or if you do it with public money, then establish some sort of bond policy so that you can get the money back when uh, people emigrate. So uh, I just wonder, and I would be interested to ask both, well, especially the Philippines, what does the Ministry of Finance think about the situation? Because they say, well, we get more than 10% of our gross national income comes from remit remittances. So that the people who go abroad, but they send money back. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, um, that's very interesting. Uh, and and the, the point that you raised is very important. Remittances are what kept the Philippine economy afloat during the pandemic. And so, uh, really, our stance is not to stop uh, migration. But um, for the first time, Tomas, for the first time in history, the Philippines is going towards that direction explicitly. Um, the Philippines has uh, had a P uh, Philippine Overseas Employment uh, Administration, you know, a bureau, a big bureau, and OWA, Overseas Welfare Association, and CFO and all these agencies, but not a policy saying, hey, we are the Philippines, we are going to respond to local needs as well as meet global demands. We've never had that. This is the first time that, that we're going towards that direction through a directive. And it's not even a policy yet, but we have been given a directive for the first time that we will meet local needs as well as global demands through proper planning and increased, produ increased production. So your question is very timely, but this is the first time in all the years that we have been deploying um, health workers that we have a directive. And that's not even a policy. Thank you for your question. Ali, do you want to uh, I, I uh, your microphone? Yeah. I, I want to get your advice on this. Uh, one of the things that, uh, yeah, since you are from the bank and you operate at a different level. <laughs> now, my question is very simple. Is there any way, uh, not the code, or directly the code, where there can be some compensatory mechanism for the people they recruit in large numbers so that our education systems can improve? You know, it's not easy to start a medical school and produce large numbers of doctors. It costs money. So uh, we uh, now first point about what you said that we have excess. That is a relative thing. If you take the numbers that uh, say in any of the developed countries, one doctor for 250, 300 uh, population. Ours we say good. When we say good in our uh, in the WHO says good, one doctor at least for thousand. And that's what the code says. They should not try to recruit from anything any country that has one one doctor or uh, less than one doctor per thousand. But one, that is, so it's a relative thing. We like to have one doctor for 500,000, which means you are double. So that's, that, that's another issue. But my question is really, is there any way to have a compensatory mechanism so that we can, uh, these countries like, say, ours or uh, Nepal can improve our education systems quickly? That um, I have to say that uh, I uh, worked for more than 25 years with the World Bank, but I've been now working for the WHO, so I need to change my talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, of course, I think the, what I, the perspective that I provided from a kind of the economist perspective uh, is simplified, and I think it's much more complex problem, right? It's because it takes a long time to educate the health professional. It costs a lot of money. So it's not just simply that we can turn up uh, and start produce more. Uh, and, uh, uh, but I think there are, there are ways how to recover the costs. I am not aware of, uh, uh, or maybe, I think it was part of the code as well. I think some provisions that uh, countries should comp compensate, but uh, I'm not aware of this large scale competition, um, um, this uh, compensation happening. Maybe it's part of the bilateral agreements. But there are other ways, like the, how you finance higher education or nursing education. 
can you establish a set of schools that are differently funded? Or, um, so I think there are uh, different ways to l potentially look at it. But I'm very interested, yes, that we hear that Philippines is uh, thinking. Uh, one, one point. Yes, uh, no. um, that's a very important uh, point, uh, Tomas. But I think it's also very crucial that uh, the direction a country takes should be explicit and clear, very clear so that all the resources and uh, machinery of the government of society moves towards that, uh, that direction. For the longest time, it was really a hit and miss. And I think it has to do with the uh, 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 political, uh, how do we, uh, they, the, the leaders were very careful not to be seen as unnationalistic or unpatriotic. If they said, okay, we would, we would uh, de deploy uh, health workers, they can be seen as unpatriotic and un that's going to be unpopular. So uh, that's not been taken before. This is the first time that uh, that direction is being made explicit. And uh, the agencies that are involved in, from the production, workforce, exit and re-entry uh, in the Philippines are now coming together for the first time and saying, hey, how do we do this strategically? How do we ensure that we have enough human resource to uh, take care of the local needs under universal health care? And we're moving towards uh, that direction already and, uh, and also respond to global demands. So uh, this is a very exciting uh, and challenging time as well. Let me say one more thing is um, I'm standing up here and this uh, new uh, trends that are emerging, especially in Europe, because uh, there was always looked at the foreign trained health professionals in countries and they were counted. They are now con counting foreign born domestically trained. So the migration happened before you got into training. Of course, then you take, it's still, uh, Migration of labor, you can cross across countries or the south, north and south, but the uh, training is happening in uh, receiving country. So. No, what I want to say was, no, we have this idea that uh, if you export, uh, or when I say export, they migrate uh, out, that they will send money to the country and that's a way of earning for next. With regard to doctors, it is not true. It is true of people who go to the Middle East for less, you know, intense labor, you know, more labor intensive kind of jobs. They send the money back because they leave their families back home and go. But doctors, when they go, they go with their families and the first thing they open is, the first thing they do is, first salary, open a bank account, you know, for, you know in the country of origin. And money never comes back. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Are there other questions? Um, uh, please come up to the microphone. And if you could introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Beth. I'm from the UK. And I actually look at this issue as kind of the ultimate moral dilemma, right? It, it, you can simplify it into brain drain, kind of how rich countries are stripping poor countries. But then I think to your point, it's a much bigger, bigger economic and political picture here. So I kind of feel like it's really difficult to fix. I don't think the code is ever going to fix it, particularly if we all respect the individual right to migrate for work, which I personally think is hugely, hugely important. But I wonder whether we need to get bigger picture here. We talk about the projected shortfall of health workers, at 10, what is it, 10 million um, by 2030. But maybe we need to be looking at, you know, we've got the future of AI and kind of digital tech, et cetera. Do we need to look at task shifting, not only within the medical professions? I really liked the way the Philippines were looking at these four different boxes. But do we need to be looking at different routes, different pathways, not just those, you know, kind of big ticket qualifications, but how are we using different professionals? And as I say, is there a future with AI and digital tech that could really help us out on some of that task shifting? Thank you. And before you answer that, if I could add that over the coming years, obviously, the um, North America, Europe, um, the demand for health workers will only increase. Yeah. Uh, the aging population is only going to uh, 
That's right. So whatever the dynamics are now, they're going to continue to be. So this question about can the health workforce become more efficient and strategic the use of AI isn't simply a question for the Philippines or Sri Lanka. The health workforce uh, within um, the countries where both the finances and the demand are growing, can there be a much smarter use of that workforce there as well? So, I'll, I'll, so it's, I think it's a challenge to both sides of the equation. I'll, I'll leave it to you then. Yes, uh, that definitely is something that we need to uh, consider. And we are actually considering. Um, an example would be, uh, you know, that uh, the Philippines is an archipelago. And uh, a, a goal of the country is to uh, not have any um, municipality or locality uh, not, uh, doctorless. But we do have islands uh, where it will not be very efficient to send, uh, say, a doctor. But if we can have telehealth, for example, um, established in that island, that would make things very efficient. We're definitely studying it, but we are not in the stage of implementation yet. Now, I only have to say I, I agree 100% with uh, what, the, what, what she said. Uh, we, we have the numbers we have as best as we could, but we could improve on it and do more analysis and do projections if we use more, what do you call this? You said IT or AI, what, whatever, which, which, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we don't use it yet, but I think there's a lot of potential for us to use it and get uh, much better, much better, much more reliable information. That is correct, and that's something we should be doing. Great. Well, picking up on that question, if I just may give you a sneak preview, um, PMAC 2025 will be looking at how to harness artificial intelligence for a healthier, equitable, and more sustainable world. So stay tuned. Ask that question again next year. <laughs> but refine it a bit because AI is going to have accelerated the tempo. <laughs> That's right. Please. Hi, I'm Shawisa from Asia Pacific Actions on uh, Alliance on Human Resource for Help. Because we just have a very good discussion a couple of days ago about international migration and we try to address the win-win-win scenario. For, uh, for migrants, designated country, and also receiving country. Uh, I would like to bring one point to the discussion on this floor because I, we got some of the uh, one, one thing that's really interests me. It's about health workforce banking. During the discussion, we are thinking about how about we have like the platform for banking that can show like the number of health workforce that we left in the country and want to export. Also, like uh, on the other, uh, on the one hand, like you know, like someone want to to export the health workforce. On the other hand, someone want to withdraw from the bank. So this is one part. The second thing is about it can uh, show up about the capacity of producing, and you know, like you know, to match the needs category needs as well. So then when it's come to the crisis and everything, we can come to this bank and then like, let's make a, a big deal together. Also with economic as well, if they have a producing capacity in one country and then another country can just like send money and then take the workers. Because you know, this, I think it's a very good uh, like innovative thought, but it also needs to think carefully about this, so I would like to bring this to the floor to, to get your comments from the floor. Thank you so much. Hi, Jerry, sir. Thank you for your question. I'm not sure whether we call it uh, uh, HR banking or human resource banking, what, but we do have um, a system in some regions in the country where, and it has nothing to do with migration. This is really local HRH, where um, a uh, specialist, for example, or a psychologist that, that's needed in, uh, in uh, certain regions and this uh, occupation is not available all throughout, we share the, the, competence, uh, the competency or we share the, the uh, 
cadre, this occupation. So the cadre, instead of being employed in one region or one uh, province, is actually employed by the region and shared across the provinces. Region is a bigger uh, unit. So higher in the region level, we can hire, say, five psychologists. Then we hire one and share that one uh, person across the provinces. The, there are implications to rights and welfare of the, that uh, psychologist, for example, but uh, it, it, it's worth exploring you know, uh, in terms of efficiency. So when you have shortage of certain occupations, that's something that you might want to consider. Alifa? No, I agree with what you said. Please, and if you could introduce yourself, thanks. Hello. Okay, so I'm Prin. I'm from IFMSA Thailand. As a medical student, I the prospect of after graduation, what are you going to do happens quite often in the discussion with friends. And one other thing that I find often is that uh, after graduation, maybe a lot of people, let's say in domestically, they like to move in Bangkok, which is uh, what I'm, which is like a lot of them. Uh, in in the Thailand, I think the system is designed for the doctor to be like uh, allocated to every province. So, but a lot of people like to come back to Bangkok. This uh, pronounced uh, problem of the let's say colonization, uh, big, a low scale colonization of a resource in Bangkok. And some of the people who like to go to overseas to study further, they, as I heard or discussion with the lecture at the faculty, they often not come back due to a lot of things like the working condition or a lot of things. But the strategy that I found that uh, is employed currently is that doctors are encouraged to self-sacrifice. But sometimes I believe that can be self-slaughter due to working conditions. Some of the doctors have to work more than two days in a row. So not surprising. but. Well, this discussion, we have been having this one for like maybe years, but with friends, there is no meaningful, let's say, meaningful end to the discussion. So I would like to raise this one to the panel today. Yeah. Okay, let's see if I got this right. Career pathing for uh, fresh graduates, is this what we're saying? Uh, where the uh, medical student after graduation can actually um, go? Is this, is this what you were asking? The career path for? You, they know what, where to go, but like uh, their final destination is often come back to the metropolitan areas where the resources is well, more abundance. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Of course, there was system uh, um, in a number of countries, we had that system, a mandatory period of uh, service in the rural, rural areas and then you get some advantages to come to the center. Indonesia practiced it, uh, when I remember when you were working there. Thailand, you all, I think you had this thing called the MESREP program, where children from uh, the rural schools were given scholarships to come to medical school and they had to go back and serve. If I remember right, there was a system uh, in Thailand also. Now I don't know whether it's, uh, it's, it's like that. Uh, but do you have a problem? Can I ask um, a question? Uh, because I just, I, it's good for all of us to know. My, my knowledge or my, my thinking is that Thailand doesn't have a major external migration issue, right? Well, f from what, m from my perspective about the healthcare worker, uh, the health personnel doctors, not so much, but a lot of doctors, they can go overseas, some of them, but like, yeah. And then there's a nurse worker who like, if I remember correctly, there are like some school that is specialized in training the nurse to go overseas, like say Germany or USA, where the needs for geriatric needs is more pronounced due to the aging population. Yeah, let me share our experience in the Philippines, uh, if I may, Dennis. Uh, we have a scholarship program called the Doc, uh, Doctor Para Sabayan, Doctors for the for the country for the nation. And this uh, doctor scholars, this medical students uh, scholars, when they graduate and they pass the board exams, the licensure, 
uh, they are required to work in the villages, in the barrios, uh, especially the poorest, the, the hardest areas, okay? But these doctors are paid the same salary as the municipal mayor. They get full benefits and they get a scholarship to a master's, another scholarship to a master's program. In other words, we take care of these doctors. Now, the traditional way was to, okay, you graduate, you go to the barrios. But now we're finding that we are getting more and more doctors and more and more scholars and more and more um, graduates. And we have broadened our perspective. Instead of just sending the doctors to the barrios, we say to these doctors, where do you feel like uh, serving? What's the track you want? Do you want to go clinical? Do you want to help the country through research or academe? Do you want to be a health administrator, a public health person, and help run the system? So there are possibilities. It's very dangerous, though, if a, a country is stuck in a certain mindset. So there has to be a responsiveness as the, the reality, reality changes, so should the, the system uh, respond. So I think that's something that you from your end, from the students and from the production, uh, can actually push. Because there are, there are experiences in other countries that it works. So it's not just free labor. You are kept, you kept in the country, but you're actually employed, employed, paid more than your, uh, your peers. Okay, so that's something that um, the Philippines is very proud of. That program has been uh, in existence for 30 years and it has worked. It has produced secretaries of health, for example, and uh, some very important leaders in the public health sector. But how large is that program? I mean, it, it, if Again, you have such a significant brain drain. How, how large is that scholarship pool? It, it's a big scholarship program, but, but I think that more than the quantity is the impact it has made on um, the health system. No, I, I appreciate it's had an impact. The question is, can you make it grow? It's in fact growing. We're growing it. Uh, it used to be that the Department of Health uh, manage this scholarship. Now, keep in mind that the Department of Health is not mandated to produce. The production is with the Department of Education, right? The, so for the longest time, there was a vacuum, so we ran that program. But now we have moved it, we're transitioning it to, to the Commission on Higher Education, who can who are very efficient and uh, who are very competent in running scholarships. And so we're finding more and more doctors and we're even worried that we may not be able to um, absorb the doctors that we produce uh, in the Doctors of the uh, Barrios program. And so we're looking at different possibilities. How can these former scholars contribute to nation building, contribute to the health sector? So it's a broader way of looking at things, not just a single. Of course, uh, you can serve for three years, and if you want to migrate, that's fine too. You've done your part. <laughs> okay, you, you've done the, your obligation. It's not such a bad thing because uh, it's es essentially employment and training. Did I answer your question? Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. You got a good question going there, huh? Uh, you can hand it, I think, to the person behind you. Hi, I'm Dr. Guada from the Philippines. Hello, ma'am. Um, I just want to continue on the topic about uh, education. I think um, there is a high demand of healthcare workforce from the Philippines because we speak good English. And it creates this big industry, the healthcare um, uh, education industry. That's probably why, Dennis, you notice there is a high attrition rate. Um, there is this, this, um, this kind of uh, put your luck, you might be a nurse or a doctor. So 
when the standards came in, like the World Federation, then everybody drops out because they don't get the standard. Because we don't really do a good screening who wants to be a doctor or not. And sometimes there is this big business and they do exploit, especially because there is a demand. So because we are not in the production side, we are not the Department of Education, I think there should be more regulation in that. Now, um, the World Federation, uh, because I came from the academe, really puts the standard. And I think putting this, they would, those who pass the standard would get the best of the graduates. So there is a brain drain. And sometimes we feel this in the, in the hospital, in the ground level, when our best skilled nurses would go abroad. It's, it's an individual decision. We cannot stop that. It's a personal right. But the effect would be is that we need to replace them as soon as possible or else they will compromise our health care. I think the economic side of, you know, of, uh, of migration is there. But we need to see a closer look on how it affects the health care or the, the, the basic services of the country. So I guess this is more of a comment than a question. Um, as uh, we have seen it um, down there, as a, a big problem in trying to retrain and putting in skills and replacing those who left for a greener pasture. Thank you. Thank you. We could build on that, and I'd actually like to go back to that question about attrition. Um, because why is it there is such a high dropout rate? Are there things you can do to address the needs? Is it a language issue? Um, are there other things that with appropriate targeted support you could get a much higher um, gradu graduation rate than currently exists? Is, is that a target? Is there something that's more flexible in there? Yeah, I think uh, this is also one of the consequences of uh, the global demands, no? uh, so migration. So you, there is a high demand for Filipino health workers Parents send their children to health um, education in droves in, by the thousands. There is, there is an attempt to overproduce because um, there is a demand. So you respond to the demand. And there is weak screening. So somebody who would be a pilot would now apply to be a nurse or, <laughs> or some, uh, something else. So um, this is something, I'm sorry. This is something that uh, um, we need to look very closely at the production side. But also, I think we have this problem because we have not been strategic. If we were to adopt a mindset of, yes, we will respond to local demands, but also to global demands, then your best nurses I've seen this uh, in St. Luke's. What they do is they do not resist it. St. Luke's is a private hospital. What they do is um, they support the, the health worker as they are be being trained, pre-service. And they say, you come to us after you graduate, we train you so that you're world class. And then we help you find a job in America. They're very strategic about it. They have not, you, they're not resisting. They're saying, oh, this is the situation now. How do we respond? And they never run out of nursing staff because they've, they've planted, they've created a mechanism where this is, it, it, it sounds uh, very disrespectful. It's almost like a, a production line. But if this were the direction we were taking as a country, for example, as in St. Luke's has taken this direction, then they have created a mechanism, they became strategic about it, and uh, they, they produced. Um, and and uh, in answer to your question, Dennis, I think this overproduction really is a, a consequence of uh, migration also, right. as well. Global. We're, we're, coming, we're coming to the last uh, five or so minutes. And what I'd like to do is to 
provide each of you an opportunity to offer some final reflections on this discussion. And Palitha, I'd like to start with you. Um, just some final two or three take-home points you would like to make sure people walk out of this room mindful of. Yeah, I will try to be positive and, you know, hopeful and encouraging because we talked of the problems. Uh, no, it is a challenge. It is a challenge. But if we get a number of our subsystems at the country level, if we get a number of subsystems at the global level or regional levels, I think we can mitigate this problem to a large extent. But since that, uh, that lady said that the basis, economic basis is very strong in this, it is certainly in Sri Lanka. Uh, the other, others, I'm not saying others are not important, there are many other important, but economic base, right now the predominant factor is economic base. So if the country's economy grows and everything else get better, it will sort out, but that might take a long time. In the meantime, I think there are a number of things that we can, simple things we can do. Get a, get, do, get a good database of the numbers, the numbers required of different categories, see different ways of deploying the, the workers you have in different mixers, the, the, the teams that need to be employed. There are a number of things that you can do to improve the services by at least 20 to 25% without any extra effort. At the same time, it is a larger issue in different, different ways. And my final take is, please let us treat it like a complex system, not a simple system, because we give shotgun solutions and think that it will work. It does not work like that. We have to address a number of things simultaneously, and the countries have, that have done that successfully have had better results. So Sri Lanka also, we are planning on doing that, because HRH is, number one, the most difficult uh, uh, element in a, in a health system, but it is also the most important element. You can't do anything without good people. That's the problem. So we have to pay, we have to pay more attention than we do now. So I hope all of us will do better in the years to come. Thank you. Um, as for me, I think I'd just like to bring it back to the original um, topic, which is HRH, migration, and decolonization, through the lens of de decolonization. I think we have to, as countries, individual countries, um, recognize the, f the effect of colonization on, on how we decide, how we think, uh, our value systems even, and uh, realize it is, what is it, it is what it is. We've been colonized, okay? But it's not such a bad thing. The important thing is, now that we're decolonized, are we in control of decision-making processes? Are we, do we have sovereignty? Do we know what direction we want to take and move towards that direction? I think that has to be very clear. A recognition of the past and how it has influenced the present, but take that power now that we're decolonized and say, this is where we want to go as a nation or as a global community even, um, um, just have very clear uh, definitions of where we want to go and uh, go towards that. It's really about power. It's about dominance. It's about decision making, sovereignty, and, uh, and self-determination. I think this is uh, where we started. And I think, um, I hope that this discussion today has helped uh, clarify this issue better through the experiences of both Sri Lanka and the Philippines. So that's it, Dennis, thank you very much. Well, thank you. First off, I hope uh, this is a session where you actually did learn something. Um, I have, and it's clear that uh, it's not a problem that's going away. You know, I think the poll dynamics are only going to get stronger. Uh, the challengers are going to get greater. Uh, and the solutions are really not that obvious, not that easy. It's a question of individual freedom, right? This is voluntary migration. Uh, and it's a migration that is incentivized, um, both in terms of economics, but we've also heard it's also a matter of social cultural dynamics as well. 
and how you meet that challenge. If it were an onerous, simple matter of a people were moving because they had to move, that's one challenge. But the fact that this is not just voluntary, it's a desired uh, movement, um, that makes it even more daunting. Uh, the question, I think, ultimately becomes how can the pullers um, be more responsible um, in um, uh, sort of addressing the consequences that they are imposing in the countries where they're pulling from. Um, so I, I'm not sure how that gets dealt with. I know the global code is struggling with that. Um, Palitha, your point about teeth, um, you know, what do teeth look like ultimately? It's a huge challenge. Um, what do teeth look like when you're dealing with voluntary issues? Uh, that's a huge dilemma. Um, but I greatly admire the work that you're doing. And again, you both, you're a returnee, you are a long timer. Um, and it's, a, it's an example of both of the desired routes we'd like to see people take. So maybe you can be an inspiration um, for those with, not just within your country, but more largely. That said, let me thank everyone for the, uh, that, you've, that you came. I hope you did learn something. And don't forget, you have a responsibility. There's a scorecard that you had access to. This is the only way that as we move forward and we think about PMAC 2025, we learn from each of these. This is not just a, you know, a scorecard. It's a learning card. So help us, help us learn. Thank everyone. Um,